Welcome to the Antioch Podcast, designed to nurture knowledge, cultivate creativity, heal the heart, and strengthen for service. Thanks for listening, and welcome home. So last week, we've, we're, we're going through the fall feast right now. We find ourselves in the, in the Jewish calendar. In Leviticus 23, we're going through the fall feasts. So it starts with Yom Teruah, which is the, the feast of shouts or the feast of trumpets, which is a wake-up call. This is the beginning of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, and, and it's based on a lunar calendar. It's have a solar calendar, so it's very different than the one that we use today. But... Um, but we're, we're in this place where now seventh month, very important month. And there's so much fulfillment in Christ in this, and, and we don't have the time to go into all of it. Um, the, the, and we could talk about it for, for years and years and years and still not cover all of the glory that God has in it. But um, here's where I want to land with it this year. Last week, we talked about Yom Teruah and these 10 days between this, this moment of waking up, this shouting, this be aware of the time in which you're living, know the season that you're in right now, prepare your hearts, and you're preparing your hearts for what's coming up, which begins tonight at sundown. Tonight at sundown is Yom Kippur. Now, this is the, the holiest holiday in the Jewish calendar. This is the highest, it's the most intense, it's the most serious holiday of all the holidays. And in between Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur, which starts tonight, are these days of awe. And during these days of awe, you're supposed to be going around and restoring relationships. Yes, your relationships with one another is incredibly important to God, and it's incredibly important to your walking with Christ. How can you say you love God who you don't see if you don't love your brother who you do see? Your relationships with one another, and please make sure you hear this, because I guarantee you're going to be offended no matter what church you go to. You'll be offended with the pastor, you're gonna be offended with the people sitting next to you, you're gonna be offended with, I don't know, the worship team, Will you love one another? God has blessed you with a family. He's given you a family, parents and siblings. Now, sometimes those parents and siblings have squandered the gift of free will that God gave them and they made some horrible choices. But it doesn't release you from the responsibility of forgiving them and loving them. Now that doesn't mean you put yourself into dangerous situations and you submit yourself to abuse, never. But you still love them, which means you seek that which is best for them, you pray for them. You don't harbor bitterness towards them. You don't hold on to offense in your heart because that's only gonna hurt you. So your relationships and restoring your relationships with, with, with family is incredibly important. You're restoring relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ, incredibly important. Um, and all of that's leading up to tonight at sundown. We go from this incredible importance of restoring relationships with family and fellowship into restoring our relationship with God. That's what Yom Kippur is all about. And it's almost as though God has given us these 10 days Get stuff right with everyone around you so that your heart is prepared to get stuff right with him. It's about getting your heart right. That's the key part here. And so we do that. We we work through relationships with others. Now, if you haven't done it yet, you have until sundown. Don't squander this opportunity. Don't waste this moment. I think there's something very spiritually powerful in the, in, in the possibility of forgiveness and restoration when you do it within God's timing. It's another side. I'm going to so go over time today, guys. Um, but can, can I just say this? Um, resting is always good for you. You, you need to Rest. We work too much. We go too fast. We need to learn to slow down. We have to learn to be still and know that he is God. We need to rest. However, when you rest on Sabbath, it's different. 
it just hits different. I don't know how to explain it. The rest that you get when you rest from, from Friday night till Saturday night is a rest that just restores your heart. So it's almost like that, that one day of rest gives you seven days worth of rest. It provides you the rest that you're going to need for the entire week. Whereas on any other day, if you take a day's rest, that'll give you a day's rest. And you know how that is. Like you, you have a day's rest, uh, let's say on, on Monday. You have a nice restful day on Monday. By Wednesday, if you're lucky, you feel just worn out. There's something about doing stuff in God's timing that makes it so much more efficient and effective. Is it, are, are, are you with me? Is that okay? Maybe you just all disagree with me. Try it. Try it and see. Test it out. God means what he says in scripture. So the day of rest, the Sabbath, is important for man. Um, there's something about this period of time for the restoration of relationships that it just seems to be easier. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it's easier. It's more effective. The healing comes twice as fast. Um, and for some reason, you just have more power, more grace to be able to do it. But all of that is to prepare us for Yom Kippur, restored relationship with God. So I'm going to read some verses to you. We're going to do a lot of scripture today, if that's okay. Um, if you have your Bibles, open up to Leviticus 23. In Leviticus 23... God is laying out the different feasts the, that the Israelites will celebrate and the people of God will celebrate. All right, so I'm going to start in verse 26, Leviticus 23, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, third book. All right, verse 26, it'll also be up on the screen. The Lord said to Moses, the 10th day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. That's Yom Kippur. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. Do no work on that day because it is the day of atonement when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Anyone who does not deny himself on that day must be cut off from his people. I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do, do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. It is a Sabbath of rest for you, and you must deny yourselves. From the evening of the ninth day of the month until the following evening, you are to observe your Sabbath. Amen. Um. Now, I don't know if you notice, there's, there's two things that really kind of keep getting repeated over and over in this portion when he's laying out what the Day of Atonement is. And by the way, Day of Atonement, atonement means at one mint. It's to make you at one with God. It's a restoring of relationship with God. That's what atonement means. So it's this day when you can be made one with God, when you can be atoned for and be connected to him. And, and one of the things that keeps coming up over and over again is this idea of do no work. Did you see it? I mean, over and over again, he's a do no work. I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. I mean, he's trying to make it very clear. Do no work. Work is the creation of good out of necessity. That's what work is. Work is a good thing, by the way. Work is a very good thing. Um, when, when we enter into eternity, we will all be working. I'm sorry if this is bad news for you. I, I'm not on the PR team for um, Christianity. I'm just trying to share the truth with you. Uh, you will be working for all eternity, but you were created to work. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Work is the creation of good out of necessity. That's what work is. Uh, just so you know, play 
Play properly done is the creation of good that is not out of necessity. That's what makes it play. But you were created to create. You were made to make things. You were made in the image and likeness of your creator, who is a creator. So work is a beautiful, wonderful thing, but work is always a creation of good out of necessity. And on this day, on the day of atonement, there is no necessity for you to create anything or accomplish anything. God is going to take care of every necessity. Now, that doesn't mean you aren't going to do anything. It's just you're not going to do work. You do not create anything out of necessity. Every necessary element, everything that is required, he will provide. And, and, and you get into trouble when we approach this idea Man, I just feel so much passion today. I don't know what it is. We get into trouble when we approach this idea like, okay, I need to contribute something to this God. And he makes it as clear as possible. If you approach this thing like you're going to do work, you will be removed. You will be destroyed. It's not going to work that way. He is providing for every necessity. And I I said, we're going to do no work, but that doesn't mean we aren't going to do anything. So what do we do? If we're not to work and try to make something happen and provide out of necessity for what is lacking, he's taking care of all that. Where does our part come in on this? The key thing is to understand we don't accomplish anything but to restore relationship with God, we have to respond to the work that he's done. We have to respond, and the way we respond is by repenting. That is what repentance is. It's our response to what God has accomplished out of necessity. Let's dive a little bit deeper. Uh, Turn back a couple pages to Leviticus 16. Mm. Oh, gosh. Man, God's doing something this morning, guys. I don't know what it is, Um, but it feels good. No amens on that? Amen. Just checking. Maybe it's just for me. I'll take it. Uh, Leviticus 16, I'm going to start in verse 3. This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. Now, by the way, before I go any further, this is setting up how the Day of Atonement is going to go down. This is prescribing the sacrifices and everything that's going to happen. This is what's happening. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He's to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his bodies. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments. So he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for the burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he's to take two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats. Now, this is going to be really important. I know this is like, wow, this is so boring. This is important. He is to cast lots for the two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. It's very important. 
Verse 11, Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering and to make atonement for himself and his household. And he's to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He's to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He's to put the incense in the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the tablets of the covenant law so that he will not die. He's to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, it's a very important sentence here, in this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place. Because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been, he is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. So now this is the scapegoat. This is the second goat. The first goat was sacrificed. Its blood was shed to, to cleanse, to make atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar. And now we're moving on to the second goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness. Okay. Oh, there's so much to say. There's so many things, and, and I'm, I'm not going to go into all of it. This is worth taking time to dive deep on, but here's just some simple things I want us to take from this and maybe give you a, a slightly different perspective on how you see things. There were two goats. The first goat is the sacrifice goat. And the sacrificial goat, the, the goat that is sacrificed, whose blood is shed... What that does is it's used to cleanse the temple and to make a way for atonement. So it basically resets the opportunity for the people to have their sins forgiven in this following year. Because for, for the Israelites, the only way that their sins are forgiven is if they bring the sacrifices to the temple and they can make the sacrifices presented at the altar and all that. So the, the point of this is kind of like a reset button so that this relationship between God and man where your sins can be forgiven is reset so that it continues to allow for this. This didn't take away all the sins of the people. It provided for the opportunity for the sins of the people to be forgiven. That, that, that's, that's a key part. That's important to understand. The second goat is the really interesting one. So first, by the blood, there's this opportunity. The, the sins are forgiven. There's this opportunity now to be made right with God. You could come and be right with God. If you bring your proper sacrifice, if you do the proper things, you could be made right with God because of the blood, because of the first goat. But then the second goat, the second goat, they put their hands on it and confessed all of the sins of the people on this goat. When they would lead this goat through the city, 
the people would scream at it and jeer. They would throw things at it. It was all of their sin was on this goat. They would spit on it. They would punch it. It represented the worst of the worst. It was everything that was horrible inside of them, in front of them, and and they're looking at it with their eyes, and they hated it. And they would lead the goat from the temple through the city so that all the people could see it. And they hated it. And then they would take the goat outside of the city, and the goat would die once it was in the wilderness. Okay. Okay. Christ is the sacrificial goat. Let's talk about this. Romans 3, 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. This is is what he's talking about, guys. This is why I don't don't understand how Christians can be like, oh, we don't need the the Old Testament. Like, you're not going to understand anything that Paul's talking about. You're going to totally misrepresent it. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Let's look at 1 John 2.2. I... I, Can I just say uh, up front, I want to read so much more of these scriptures and read more of the context and go way into it. But honestly, I want us to get to a place where we can respond. And so I'm just giving you little bits of pieces. And so please go back and study more and read more. But 1 John 2, 2. John is referring to Jesus and he says this. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, so does that mean the whole world is now forgiven? Everyone goes to heaven. There is no hell. This is kind of a popular teaching. The atoning sacrifice provided for the opportunity for connection with God. It didn't supply it. It provided for the opportunity. That's important to understand. It's like, okay, now it's available to you. Now perfect union with God is available to you. But Christ wasn't only the sacrifice, he was also the scapegoat. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21, it says this. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them as he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was, were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So there's the, that next step and here's the scapegoat. Verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Or a more direct version, 1 Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. Jesus was the scapegoat. He carried all of our sins on him. And just like the goat that was led through the streets from the temple, so also Jesus on the Via Dolorosa 
walked through the city. And what did the people do when they saw him? They spat on him. They ripped out his beard. They punched him. They hurled insults at him. Because they saw all the sin and brokenness in them right in front of them, in front of their eyes. Whether they realized it or not, he himself bore all of our sins. He became sin itself. Every sin that you've committed, maybe committing right now or will ever commit, all of that sin, he became it. And he took it to the cross. So how do we restore our relationship with God? What does that look like? Um, Let's go back to the first verse from Leviticus 23. Mm. Leviticus 23 starting in verse 26 again. I'll just read through this portion one more time. This is the shorter one, not the really big one. The Lord said to Moses, the 10th day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. Okay, pause. I told you there's two things that are highlighted in this portion of scripture. The first one is that you are to do no work. Do no work. You're bringing nothing to the table that needs to be done that is going to um, bring provision. There's nothing of necessity for you to bring to the table. And I said that you doing no work doesn't mean you're not doing anything. What are we doing? Here's the second thing that's really highlighted and see if you can see it as we read through it. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. Do not work on that day because it's the day of atonement when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Anyone who does not deny himself on that day must be cut off from his people. I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. It is a Sabbath of rest for you, and you must deny yourselves. From the evening of the ninth day of the month until the following evening, you are to observe your Sabbath. What's the second highlighted portion in there? Deny yourself. yourself. Over and over again. You must deny yourselves. And somehow that was translated to just be, oh, just fast, just don't eat food. It's so much more than that. Denying yourself is so much more than just that. Denying yourself is letting go of yourself. It's, it's, it's dying to self. It's the giving up of yourself. It's like I, I no longer live, yet Christ lives in me. That is what denying yourself is. It's, it's letting go of it all. Restoring relationship which means to be one and to be connected with God, to be in union with God, that's communion. This is what communion is. It's the being made one with God. It's being restored to God, being in co-union with him. And remember, in communion, our part No one is bringing anything to the communion table. Right? No one's like, hey, I saw we're doing communion. I brought some pastrami so we could make sandwiches with it. Like, no. (laughs) Bringing nothing. Nothing of necessity is brought. You don't bring your own bread and go, oh, here, can, can you bless this?
You bring nothing of necessity to the communion table. You just come yourself and receive. But it's more than just taking from the table, or at least it should be. And and this is where I think all the warnings of like, make sure you take communion in a worthy manner comes from. Understand what you're doing. Understand that in coming and taking communion, this is an exchange. It's not just a receiving. Like the scapegoat, we have to cast all of our sins on him. Don't receive this bread if you're holding on to the sin in your life. You can't just add him to it. He's not going to be like, let me jump into your heart. Oh, here's this woman you're committing adultery with. Can you scoot over a little bit? I just want to get in here. Let me get in here with you. No, no, no. You, you got to get all that stuff out of there. Oh, there's big piles of money on here. Let me just scoot that over. I'll just sit next to it. It's fine. Yeah, you, you guys, this is, this is what we do. We have to, like the scapegoat, we have to come and we have to place all of our sins on him. And let's be honest, we've got more every day to place on him. All of our brokenness, all of our stinking thinking, all of that stuff, all of our cares, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Give him all of your lives, everything. And like, I want to say I must decrease so that he can increase, but it's like more than that. You can't just decrease. You have to disappear completely. It's all of you. You got to let it all go. You have to let it all go. This is what repentance is. Not that I'm accomplishing anything or creating anything good out of necessity. Make no mistake, I need salvation. I need communion with God. I need to be restored in relationship with God. There's no question. I'm not saying that's not necessary. That is absolutely necessary. You just don't have anything in yourself to make that necessity be met. He provides it all. You do no work, but you have to deny yourselves. You have to let go of all those things you're holding on to that you know are not who you are. You have to let go of all the sin that so easily entangles. You have to stop thinking those thoughts. You have to stop looking at those images. The blood, if I could give you another picture for this, the blood unlocked the chains. The blood unlocked the cell door. But you're still held captive while you stay in the room. If you hold on to those chains, you're not leaving. He made a way. There's therefore now nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Why are you holding on to those chains? Just just drop them. And it's not even like, oh, I got to get these chains off. No, he's already done it. They'll just fall right off. The, the door's open. Yeah. Just push it open and walk through. All the necessary things have been taken care of. All of the locks are unlocked. That's the necessary part. And you didn't have a key, so you had nothing to bring to this formula. He had the keys and he opened the locks with his blood. And now we just have to walk it out. Remember, in communion, it's not just the wine. It's the wine and the bread. It's the blood and the body. We need the blood 
to unlock the locks, to open the door. We need the blood to make it possible to be atoned to God and be made right with him. But we need the body that we may lay our hands on it and release all of our sins, give all of our sins to it. All of our doubts, all of our struggles, all of our frustrations, all of our everything, to give our whole lives to him. And he becomes all of that sin. This is repentance. This is our part. He did the work. He shed the blood. Cast your sins upon him. Let him be the scapegoat and carry it all away. And just like the goat was led out into the wilderness, so Christ left the city, went out into the wilderness to Golgotha and died on the cross. and killed the power of sin in that moment. So before we take communion together, and we don't normally take communion together except for the first of the month, but I just really felt like we needed to do it today. I just want to give you a moment. And I just want you to do some soul searching. Check your heart. Is there any sin you're holding on to? Stop trying to fix it and just give it to him. Is there any brokenness? This isn't about you fixing it. It's about giving it to him. It's about letting it go. Putting your hands on the scapegoat and letting him just carry it out and remove from your sins as far as the east is from the west. He'll just take it away. And you don't have to deal with it anymore. You don't have to beat yourself up. He was already beaten up. Stop trying to do work. Stop trying to add something of necessity. This is kind of a strange thing for me to say. Stop trying to feel bad about it even. Just let it go. You feeling bad isn't going to add anything to it. I, oftentimes when we feel bad, it helps us to recognize the sin that's in it. But if you know the sin's in you, it doesn't matter whether you feel bad or not. Get it out of there. Just let it go. Today is a day of repentance. Today is a day of repentance. And it's possible because he is our atonement. Because he did the work. So, We're just going to take like two minutes and it's just going to be quiet. I'm not having the worship team come up, not doing any of that. Search your hearts. If there's anything that you need to put onto that scapegoat, I want you to be free today. Drop the chains, walk through the gate and find freedom. Deny yourselves. Let go of it. And so in an act of prophetic example, I'm, I'm just going to ask that as you, as you pray through, as, as something comes up, just extend a hand to the bread. This bread is the body of Christ. And just like they laid their hands on the, on the scapegoat and released all their sins on it, we do the same. So we're going to take two minutes. And as something comes up, just give it to him. Something else comes up, give it to him. Search your hearts. And see what you need to repent of and just let it go.
Okay, last chance. Anything else you have to release, just release it now. Lord, we thank you for being the scapegoat. And somehow we can trade our sins for your righteousness. That you take all of our sins, not just you take it, you become our sins, Lord. Let me have your eyes, because you need to see this. All of your sins, all of your brokenness, all of your wrong thoughts, all of, the, all of the things that you do and you don't do that you should do, all of that stuff is right here. And it's taken to the cross, and the power of it is broken in your lives. It no longer has any power over you. It is done you can be in union with God, in co-union with God because of communion, because of the blood that made a way, because of the body that was broken, that became sin and was broken. Nothing separates you now. Nothing separates you from the love of God. Nothing. Do no work. No work. Just repent. Just keep giving it to him. As often as you need to, he'll take it. Just keep giving it to him. And then he invites us amazingly to come and receive. He takes our ashes and he gives us beauty. He takes our brokenness and he heals us. He takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. That's a pretty amazing deal. Thank you for listening. To continue the journey, you can find us online at IamAntioch.com or join us next Sunday.